Hello, I'm Darina Abugaida. This is Counting the Cost on Al Jazeera, your look at the world of business and economics. This week, millions of people could be forced to move as sea levels rise. But as the cost of building sea defenses increase, we ask why wealthy nations aren't delivering on promised money. Big investors hand out billions to startups every year, but women and ethnic minorities are missing out. Plus, when rich Americans don't want to pay high taxes, they head south to Florida. Despite the pandemic, we'll tell you about the migration that's underway. Warnings about the consequences of climate change are arriving at an alarming pace. It's vulnerable countries who will be the most affected despite being the least responsible for climate change. And it appears we may have miscalculated the impact. Researchers at the University of Copenhagen say sea levels could rise more than previously estimated. It may be just an additional 25 centimeters, but at 1.35 meters by the end of the century, it means we need to cut our emissions by an additional 200 billion metric tons. That's the equivalent of five years of global CO2 emissions just to match the previous target. Well, what does that mean in financial terms? If sea levels rose by 1.8 meters or the height of an average man, it would cost $27 trillion a year by 2100. And right now, those costs can be mitigated for a sum of $300 billion a year, but that's a tenfold increase on estimated funding because rich nations haven't stumped up the cash for vulnerable nations to build resilience like early warning systems for storms or regrowing coastal mangroves to protect against storm surge. And one place under threat from rising sea levels is the city of St. Louis in Senegal. France and the World Bank have donated more than $40 million to help people living in the UNESCO World Heritage Site adapt to climate change. Nicholas Hack is in St. Louis, Senegal. An unexpected tide swept away Zinabou Fall's home. With it, a lifetime of memories. Remember, she says to her son Adama, how in a matter of hours, our living room where you used to watch TV, kitchen, and your bedroom were wiped away by the ocean's currents. They now live on the outskirts of the city with thousands of others displaced, a new life the city council told them to adapt to. We're being forced to live a difficult life here. This was supposed to be temporary, and we're living here now for two years. There's no food, no help, and no sign from authorities anything will change. We won't be able to return home. To save what is left of what used to be the capital of the colonial-era French West Africa, France and the World Bank have raised $40 million for what they call climate adaptation. The funds have so far been used to buy more tents, educate displaced children, and construct new embankments. But when the tide recedes, the ocean's destruction appears. Entire neighborhoods of a historic UNESCO World Heritage Site are swallowed into the Atlantic. In 2006, the city cut a three-meter breach in an embankment thinking it would empty out the water. Instead, it allowed more of it in, with the breach growing to eight kilometers long. Making matters worse, new sand formation has made it dangerous for fishermen to navigate. <laughs> It's a catastrophe. More than 500 fishermen have drowned because of the breach. People are desperate now. That's why so many young people are leaving Saint Louis to try to get to Europe. More than 20,000 people made it to Spain's Canary Islands last year, many from Saint Louis. As a result, the Spanish Coast Guards can now be seen patrolling Saint Louis shores. For Spain, protecting Europe from a wave of illegal migration starts here. But there is no protection against the rising oceans for the Senegalese living here. And while rich polluting countries ask poor countries to adapt to a changing climate, people here say the damage is done, it's too late. In the camp, an elder takes Zinebu's son Adama aside. You have nothing to lose, he explains, showing him a picture of a young man who is now in Madrid. With so much loss, adapting to a changing climate means letting her son go and brave the ocean's tide in search of a safe place to live. Nicholas Hawk, Al Jazeera, Saint Louis, Senegal. Joining me to discuss rising seas levels and how we measure and account for economic growth, we have two experts on the subject. From London is University of Cambridge professor Sir Partha Dasgupta. He's the author of the UK government's independent review on the economics of biodiversity. 
And from Copenhagen, Denmark, is Aslai Grinstead, who's an associate professor of physics of ice, climate, and earth. Welcome to you both. Thanks very much for joining us on Counting the Cost. Um, Aslai, let me start with you. You believe that seas are rising faster and higher than previously estimated. Uh, why is that? And, and put that into context for us and tell us what that means. Like we, we, we have looked at the data from, from 1850 and forwards, and there we can see that sea levels, they are rising. Uh, and they are rising faster and faster. And then we hold that together with the observations of how Earth has warmed. And we, we can, from that we can see the, that uh, we can extract how sensitive or how strongly the sea levels respond to, to warming. And then we compare that, that's just like we get out simply like how much faster does sea level rise when we warm Earth by one degree. And we can compare that to what we see in the, in the models that are used to project sea level, and we see that they are inconsistent, these sensitivities. And that is what leads us to conclude that, that the models, they are simply not sensitive enough, and therefore that I expect that sea level should, or the projections actually should be higher. Right. Uh, Sir Partha, so are we adequately capturing the economic impact from climate change? No, not one bit. We are far, far, far from it. Uh, because the uh, treatment of the biosphere um, includes the effects that our activities have on climate, but it includes a lot more. Biodiversity loss itself, the loss of life, life in the most general sense. Biodiversity is the diversity of life. Right. And uh, we are really eating into it. So then would changing the way we measure economic growth help to redress the balance between nature and, uh, quote unquote, the exploitation that's going on of the Earth's resources? That's exactly right. Uh, we have to change it in a big way, moving away from uh, GDP, which is a measure that does not, does not account for the depreciation or degradation of Mother Nature. That has to be included. We ought to be measuring stocks. In other words, the, uh, the wealth we have, which includes uh, nature, and um, the movements in wealth will pick up the degradation of capital, natural capital, nature, biosphere. I'm using these terms interchangeably. Um, so we really have to make an incredible adjustment to the way we assess what we are doing, and then, of course, have policies which will go in line with the revised assessment. Aslak, uh, you were mentioning research a moment ago. Let me put this to you because there was some research that came out of the University of Leeds and it claims that 28 tons of ice, trillion tons of ice that is, was lost uh, between 1994 and 2017. And that's in fact equivalent uh, to a sheet of ice 100 meters thick covering the entire of the UK. So let me ask you this. How do we mitigate for such rises in sea levels? And in your opinion, is it too late? If it is too late, like, I mean, like it is, we are, we are basically committed to a sea level rise. And it's a, it's the question of which path we take is just a question of how fast the sea levels will rise. It will, the seas will rise and we just have to adapt to it. It is obviously going to be much more difficult to adapt to a very fast sea level rise. Uh, and I mean, if we if we follow the worst case the warming scenarios, then then we are actually also uh, risking triggering some 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 collapses of the ice sheets that that that, that will be extremely difficult to handle for society. Right. How do we actually adapt to it, though? <laughs> that's uh, that's very difficult for from. It's it depends on where you are exactly on which coastline you are, but the, the, it is. Like you cannot stop the seas from rising. So, so, and and uh, in the short term, then of course you can you can protect yourself with physical barriers or something like that. Which, uh, but uh, but in the long term, I think that it really is such big sea level rise that that uh, that retreat and uh, is in many places the only option. In many places, the only option that we simply have to move away from the the coasts. Right. And Sir Prather, a moment ago, you were saying that almost all governments are exasperating the biodiversity crisis and by paying people more to exploit nature than to protect it. So can you actually put a number on that for me and tell me, is it time for governments to cut off subsidies? Well, the review estimates, office estimates of the 
global subsidies to nature of on, on the use of nature uh, they are of the order of four to six trillion US dollars per year. So that's about a little over 5% of global GDP. That's a huge amount of subsidy. In other words, we are paying ourselves to uh, diminish nature. Um, moreover, you have these in large, large bodies of that nature, uh, which we call biomes, like the uh, uh, tropical rainforests, which are public goods in the sense that they serve humanity in many, many ways throughout, okay? So although they're located in particular national ju jurisdictions, they are serving everybody. Then there, of course, there are the open oceans, the, beyond the exclusive economic zones, large swaths of biomes in which uh, uh, the, there is living matter and huge numbers of processes undertaking, which are being undertaken, which, are, uh, which influence our lives. Now, if the oceans were dead, then we would all be dead. And yet we use the oceans as a free good. We don't pay for the journeys we make, the transportation, the cruises. Uh, in other words, paying ourselves, because of course nature doesn't offer us a bill, doesn't submit a bill to us as we are using. So we have to create the bills for us for internal auditing, if you like, so that they become more expensive. They're not negative price, but positive price that will limit our use. So we'll have to reshape our lives in a way that contains the biosphere so that we, it contains us. Why do you think rich nations are not delivering on promises uh, to provide low income nations uh, and most importantly, nations that have nothing to do uh, with CO2 emissions with money to mitigate against rising sea levels? I think in some deep sense, we are not alert to the damage we are doing to the biosphere. It's a very elusive subject. Climate has caught the imagination because it has some visible impacts. Changes in climate have visible impacts. Um, extreme weather events, droughts, ex extended droughts, uh, and so forth. Hurricanes, and, and, and thus. These were predicted. Climate scientists are pretty good. Uh, they predicted it, that we will have more, greater frequency. We observed that. The problem with biodiversity loss, which is a far deeper problem, because the biosphere it, and its most general is actually keeping the entire fabric of our lives alive, so to speak. Uh, we are able to maintain ourselves. We've enjoyed a rather equitable um, background in which to evolve. And when biodiversity is diminished, much of it we can't actually observe. So much of biodiversity is in the soils, for example, in the peatlands. Uh, now, you don't observe that. They're unobservable. Right. Much of nature is silent also. So appreciating that requires a certain amount of inquisitiveness, uh, inquiring mind, and we have not been trained for that. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Sir Partha Dasgupta, for joining us from London, and Asli Grinsa, thank you so much for speaking to us from Copenhagen. Most welcome. As California and New York continue their fight against the coronavirus pandemic, a dramatic migration is underway. Wall Street firms, tech companies and the wealthy are leaving in huge numbers. Driven out by high taxes, strict COVID restrictions and the new normal of remote working, a shift to sunnier climates is underway. Andy Gallagher reports from Miami. Tearing down the old to make way for the new. Miami's construction boom was already well underway before COVID-19 hit. Now it's ramping up as businesses keen to escape high taxes, cramped cities and expensive real estate look for new opportunities. This whole area of Wynwood is going to be the new epicenter of construction for Miami. Across Miami, spaces are being snapped up faster than they can be built. It's all part of a potentially seismic shift as money moves away from states like New York and California that have been decimated by COVID-19. I would say utter Wild West. It's completely 180 from what it was about a year ago when uh, COVID hit. Uh, all of a sudden you have every tech firm, every major hospitality firm, every restaurant group all coming in. Not just Miami, all South Florida. We're seeing a huge increase in numbers in Fort Lauderdale, Del Rey, Boca Raton, Palm Beach, no inventory.
It's a mass migration city officials are keen to embrace. For years, they've been trying to convince businesses that Florida is more than just beaches and sunshine. One of the most vocal proponents of making the move is Miami's Mayor Francis Suarez, who's promoting the city in more expensive states like California. I think if we're able to continue to capitalize on this moment and truly convert it into a movement where things tectonically shift, um, I think that Miami could catapult very quickly to being one of the most important cities on the planet. The exodus includes tech companies from Silicon Valley as California continues to fight COVID and Wall Street firms ready to embrace remote working and take advantage of Florida's lower taxes. It's not just Miami's skyline where you can see the changes. Here on the waterways of Miami Beach, there's so much more traffic for people that can own or rent boats that local residents are complaining. But with so much wealth and power moving to this city, what about Miami's lower income communities? Affordable housing has been a long-term issue here, but prices are sharply rising across the city. Much of this state is driven by low-wage service industry jobs, already hit hard by the pandemic, something advocates for cheaper housing say needs to be taken into account. We have over and over and over made the mistake of not factoring in who lives here now? How can we improve the lives of people who live here now instead of driving them out? And so this is, you know, we've made that mistake plenty of times enough to learn that up front that has to be part of the deal. And so as we look to redevelop, for example, publicly owned land, right, to, you know, create more units of housing, right, that's got to be built in. We need housing that is priced at a more affordable level. The rapid growth and investment here seems set to continue for some time. This state's less stringent approach to tackling the pandemic and keeping businesses open is also attracting new residents. In stark contrast, cities like New York and Los Angeles experience long shutdowns, something that many business owners push back against. Miami's mayor says all those factors make this city attractive and will benefit new arrivals and those already here. And what some call gentrification, others call economic opportunity um, and, and, and the ability for upward mobility. So it's really hard when you talk about income inequality and you talk about poverty uh, to create opportunities if you don't create high paying jobs. And obviously there's a second piece to it, which is making sure that there's an educational system in place that allows people to be successful. And that's something that we're gonna to continue to work on to make sure that we're on the cutting edge of that as well. The pandemic has changed the lives of millions, the way we work and where we live. What Miami becomes in the years ahead is anyone's guess. Who benefits and who's left behind may be more consequential. Andy Gallagher ending that report there. Now, the pandemic has exposed the gap in societies with low-income workers disproportionately losing their jobs or lives. The UK's Trade Union Congress says the pandemic has held up a mirror to the structural racism in the labor market. Well, the unemployment rate among black, Asian and minority ethnic groups rose to 9.5% by the end of last year. That's compared to 4.5% for white workers. But there has also been structural problems when women and ethnic minorities try to access money. The rise of the Black Lives Matter movement has increased scrutiny on Wall Street, Silicon Valley and London's financial center, with many banks pledging to do more to increase representation. Now, according to Reuters, black founders of companies received just over 3% of the $148 billion given out in U.S. venture capital in 2020. Well, joining me now from London is Angelika Buraska. Angelika is the Chief Operating Officer at SFC Capital. Thanks very much for your time uh, on Counting the Cost. As I was just saying, the venture capital industry doesn't really have a healthy relationship with diversity. Uh, why is that? Uh, yes, you are right. Um, the recent BBCA report on diversity and inclusion tells us that less than 1% of UK venture funding goes to all female teams. Uh, only 13% of senior people on UK investment teams are women and almost half of investment teams have no women at all. Um, even FCA report from 2019 uh, says that only 17% of FCA approved individuals uh, were females. Uh, but it's a very complex issue and um, the industry started to pay more attention to this problem. And the reality is that we are still learning and trying to understand uh, the, the real issues. 
yes, uh, the industry has to do more, has to pay more attention, has to buy us free, uh, has to be uh, more open for diversity. Uh, but there are other problems uh, that are lying outside uh, of the industry, uh, and they are related to culture, to education, um, to the way even how uh, girls and members of uh, ethnic minority groups are, are, are uh, directed at the very early stages of their education and career. Right, so practically then what is needed to push the boundaries and diversity in top jobs, for example? Does it start with education, uh, training or regulation or something else? Uh, everything, I would say. Uh, we need collaboration from many actors, not just uh, not just decision makers within the industry. Um, so to give you some examples, uh, Women Engineering Society reported that in 2018, only 12.37% of engineers were women. Interestingly, they also reported that 25% uh, of girls 16 to 18 years old conce would consider a career in engineering compared to 50, almost 52% of boys. Uh, WISE campaign uh, reported that between 2018 and 19, only 10.3% of workforce uh, were, were, were female and 16.4% uh, females in tech jobs. So, you know, it's not just a problem of financial industry and venture capital. Um, it, it's a, the roots of the issue are much deeper and it's related to, yes, how we raise girls. Just think of the first toy that a little girl will be given. It's probably a doll and a boy for him will give him a, a, a figure of a superhero or a, a toy car. Right. That tells us something. Right. Um, so I think that there's a lot that has to be done. There, we need more systemic support on the childcare because um, in terms of childcare, the workload is much bigger on mothers than fathers. Um, so in this way, we'll build equal opportunities before a new generation comes to the market, to the, to, to the job market. Uh, here's the and, thing, uh, money, money needs to change, doesn't it? Because existing pools of money are mostly from very rich white men. So how do you democratize that? Oh, well, that's a very good question. Um, and I think that uh, there's not one solution for that. Uh, it's something that will be changing over generations. Um, and we see already that change. We see a lot of successful businesswomen out there. Uh, even in my case, uh, when I was starting my career, I was looking at Deborah Meaden and uh, if you know Dragon's Den or if you know business uh, in the UK, she's a very successful woman uh, and she was very helpful to raise awareness that uh, female can be, females can be successful in, in different roles. Um, but democratizing uh, this space is not going to be easy. Uh, as I said, it requires a lot of different actors to act together. And just let me ask you about your own experience since you brought it up. I mean, you yourself, you're in a pretty powerful position. So was it difficult for you to get there? And also when you see women like Jane Fraser, who's the new CEO of Citi, uh, the first woman to take the top job at one of Wall Street's four biggest banks, are you hopeful for the future? Yes, I am. Um, in terms of my journey, um, I came where I am through entrepreneurship and my business interests. As I said, I was looking at a successful woman like Deborah Meaden, uh, and I wanted to be like her. So I came to London with my own project. I started to network, uh, to meet people. And um, it's always a combination of a lot of hard work and a little bit of luck. Um, so my journey um, had a turn when I met Stephen Page, uh, the founder of SFC Capital, and that was a new project for him as well. He invited me to join, and I decided to jump uh, on the deep water, uh, and I grew with the business. I am where I am because I stick to the business. Uh, I was working on setting up the structures, um, recruiting the team, uh, and uh, we had to be more competitive and better than anyone else at the time. Um, and I think that it is important to give visibility to uh, successful uh, business uh, women like Jane Fraser, like Deborah Meaden, like uh, Alison Rose, Ursula Burns. Uh, 
Uh, but not because they are women, but because they are good in what they are doing. Uh, they are better than other male and female. Um, and we need to show that it is a viable option for younger generation. Angelika Borowska, we thank you so much for speaking to us. Uh, very inspiring. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. And that's our show for this week, but there's more for you online at aljazeera.com slash ctc, and that'll take you straight to our page, which has entire episodes for you to catch up on. I'm Darin Abogaida from the whole team. Thanks for joining us. The news on Al Jazeera is next. <laughs>